it over to uh, Mike and Blake to talk about homebrew. Uh, Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, start with a couple of questions, if that's all right. Um, so, can you raise your hand if you already have some idea what homebrew is? <laughs> uh, raise your hand if you kind of use homebrew on a daily or weekly basis. Okay, again, a decent number of people. You realize like no one in Fostep trusts us, right? <laughs> yes. Dirty Mac. Uh, and if you've ever submitted a pull request to homebrew, put your hand up. Awesome. Thank you very much. And hopefully I actually merge some of that as well. Uh, right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, Homebrew, as you all know already, similarly, is a relatively popular package manager for Mac. Um, it's, as you probably noticed already, pretty different to what various Linux package managers do. In some ways, some of which are good, some of which are bad, some of which we may change in the future, others of which we wish we could change if we can't. Um, so, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that I think we've learned through kind of building Homebrew some of the different things we do, and then open up to questions at the end. So if you have any thoughts or questions, then I'm not to Right, so my name is Mike Quaid. I am employed by GitHub for the last like two and a half years or so. GitHub doesn't pay me to work on Homebrew unless I like we're using Homebrew for something and it always explodes and I'm just getting very upset. And I will justify spending my work time on Homebrew. Other than that, it's just like a spare time project for me mostly. Um, I've worked on Homebrew for seven years or so. About started working on it about a year after the project started. And so I think I'm the longest main, running maintainer who's actually still working on it. Um, I don't know whether that's a good thing or whether that's just I have like I'm not able to give up on things. I do this. Anyway, um, so the first thing that Homebrew does a bit differently to other package managers is we use like GitHub forks and pull requests for most of our contributions. So on most package managers, the way things tend to work is you have a person or a number of people who maintain a particular package. And when that package needs updates, when that package is broken, when users have issues with that package, those are generally the people who dig in. Now, Homebrew has, as I'll show you in a minute, 10 maintainers, essentially, and about 4,000 packages in our main repository, roughly, for our officially supported repositories. So it doesn't really scale to have each person maintaining and actively like checking the change logs and stuff for 400 sites um, and 400 pieces of software. So what we do is we rely on the community to do that for us. Although we only have 10 maintainers, we've had 5,472 people as of when I made these slides. So it's probably a couple more in the last few days, um, in the last seven years that have And that's really great. And what that means is that our maintainers have more of a job of effectively like shepherding community contributions, checking things, trying to sort of help people like get pull requests in and get changes in. Um, so as a result, that means that kind of frees us up to kind of do other things and try and make things easier for the community to run things. On the downside for that, that does mean there's a lot of pull requests we have to manage. There's that many in seven years. Like I get probably like 200 emails a day. Um, just from the main Homebrew repository, if I subscribe to like everything, I would probably get more. Um, so, like managing that with each ten people is kind of difficult. But I think that's for us at least. It feels like that's a model that has actually worked relatively well. Um, what we would have probably done if I could go back in time is have more maintainers added like earlier in the project for quite a while. There was only like one, two, three of us, four or five. Uh, and then we've had, I think we've doubled the number of maintainers in the last kind of two years or so, which is great because I think previously we, we looked for people who like already knew exactly what they were doing, whereas now I'm trying to look a bit more for people who are enthusiastic and willing to learn and embrace kind of feedback. And then those people can quite often be kind of built up and maintained. So one of the maintainers is in the room today. I've not met them before. So I have seen a picture of them, but I'm going to try and find them afterwards. So. And I'll give you a clue, it's one of the people whose face does not resemble the human face up there. Anyway, uh, so another thing Homebrew did, which was, I guess, gets us put, put in a bucket of like hipster programmers, was it was written in Ruby. And um, I guess Ruby and GitHub sort of had a rise about the same sort of time. Um, how much of one is due to the other, who knows? But basically, that meant that combined with the sort of GitHub model, like being in this kind of hipster sphere, 
apart from being mocked a little bit, it did mean that we were able to attract sort of interest and contributions from a particular community. And that community embraced us pretty strongly early on. And then I think that community has grown as Scrum has grown, and that's, I think, been good for everyone. Um, and I think the nice thing with that, this text is going to be way too small, probably, for people to read, unless you passed the Weave site test recently. Um, but like, we have, in Homebrew, a nice kind of Ruby-based DSL. Um, that's domain-specific language, uh, <coughs> trying to de jog and it a little bit. Um, basically, it should be, like, even if you've not done huge amounts of programming in Ruby, it's like relatively easy to like work out what's going on. And I think that's a nice thing with Ruby is that it means that you can be very expressive and you can make these domain specific languages quite easily in such a way that people can write stuff that means it's quite readable even to people who don't necessarily know Ruby. So again, I think if we could do it again, we would use Ruby again. Um, but we would maybe do a couple of things differently. We're currently moving some of our code to bash, bizarrely. And uh, one of the reasons for that is Partly performance, like if you want something to respond like instantly, um, I like under 0.5 seconds, like spinning up the Ruby interpreter and like loading a bunch of Ruby code is relatively slow. Um, so it's not as great for performance for certain things. And the other thing that's kind of nasty is the way you require files in Ruby with our update system. It has a Ruby process which then uses Git, changes a bunch of code, and then loads new code, which obviously may or may not have required existing code and yeah, that stuff gets very complicated. So we're in the process of rewriting all our update stuff in Bash. So we can just say, okay, that's fine. Like we'll do all the updates before we load any Ruby code, which should help. Right. So another thing we do is we don't use the root user. Um, we may need to use the root user to initially set up from root, like running sudo to kind of change the permissions or whatever. But you can do everything from root without admin rights, without the root user without sudo or whatever on your system if you choose to do so, if you want to install it in your user directory or whatever. And I guess this is a bit of a difference from like Linux package managers, which typically like are managing the entire system, so it necessitates people as a root. But it's, I guess, different from other, like some of the other OSX package managers as well, that use root for various things. So the thing I like about this, and the thing where this makes our life easier, it's obviously like, it's, you can still do quite a lot of damage as a non-root user, but it's nice to be able to say, okay, well, at least the damage is constrained to the particular user you are running Ruby as. So if you want to separate that user to another thing um, and use that for some sort of privilege separation, you can do that and you understand the effects of how. It's also more similar to how most software installation works on OSX. Um, the original kind of intent of Ruby was it would behave kind of like other stuff in OSX, you know, if you download a dot app bundle for Chrome or whatever, you tend to just download that as your normal user, drag and drop that to applications, and that's that. So this obviously will put it to the app store, so that permission is not really something which felt right and familiar to us, and it's not really caused us any problems, and it's been nice to see, like, obviously there's bugs, and when formula, like, run the kind of arbitrary code on people's systems, and download and run arbitrary code on people's systems, like, it's nice to have some degree of not allowing that to form the entire system. Right, another thing we do uh, is we make use of system libraries when they're available. So, like, I used to make fun of MacWords a bit, but being a MacWords maintainer have become friends, so now I don't do that anymore. Uh, so, but this was the, I'm gonna show the, the typical thing I would use, so that there's a difference between the two rather than necessarily us being better. Uh, but anyway, so this is, if you look at what it was a while ago when I prepared this slide at least, um, the dependencies on MacOS for if you're installing Git. So there's some runtime dependencies, which are rsync and some curl libraries, and then there's some libraries like curls and like OpenSSL. <coughs> so the same list on uh, Homebrew's version of Git is this, effectively. So we don't actually need anything from the system uh, if you're installing Git. We don't have any dependencies, sorry, we do, we don't have to install any dependencies through Homebrew because we use the stuff in the system that's provided. <coughs> Apple provides various crypto libraries, they provide their own version of curl and stuff like that. Um, and what this means for the end user is on the downside, you don't get all the cool new shiny things and maybe a new version of curl supports some new thing like speedy or whatever. And then if we compile Git against that, then we don't support that. But then on the other side, it does mean your compilation is faster and that we are able to effectively 
lean on Apple to do some of our kind of OS updates and library updates and stuff like that and rely on them. Obviously, there's a bit of contention about this. People disagree with the process and whether it was a good idea. But I feel like, on the whole, we would probably do this again. It hasn't caused as much grief and it ends up speeding up things quite a bit for end users. <coughs> so, our updater, as I mentioned before, pulls files down to Git. So, like the homebrew repository is like it contains all of the, the code that makes homebrew run and do itself, the stuff it does, and all of the formula, which are effectively the package description files as well. Um, and these are in one repository, so that I'll come on to later, but that is perhaps a little bit of a mistake. But then what we do with homebrew is we download all these files on first run and then we update them incrementally using it. So that basically means that some of the normal things around writing some sort of update system are effectively solved for us using Git. But then that comes across with a whole new bunch of pain as well, like if someone can modify files and there's a merge conflict or whatever. And particularly if people are developers and they know what they're doing with Git, then that's relatively easy to solve. But then if people aren't, then like Git starts spouting that merge conflict and people get very scared. So I think with hindsight, that was probably not a wise decision for people made. I think it would have been easier for us to have just, well, it wouldn't have been easier, but it would be better for us to have rolled our own updater, I think, um, and downloaded the stuff ourselves, um, because it would have avoided all the Git pain, because now we're, again, in this process of moving towards this batch updater, we're being a bit more stringent in terms of, we will just kind of blow away files that you've changed and stuff like that, unless you've committed them and made a branch and all this type of stuff. So we basically have to choose, unfortunately, with this stuff, because of we have a bunch of people who rely on previous behavior. Do you try and help the previous power users to know who know what they're doing to interact with Git nicely in the way they want to, or do you lean more towards kind of novice users and say we're effectively just going to take over if you get here and we're going to go and you know check stuff out, stash stuff, reset stuff for you without you asking us to? And I think we're leaning more towards the latter and optimizing for uh, novice users because that's the way of getting less tickets. Right, so another thing we do uh, is we install packages in prefixes based on their package and version. So for example, uh, we have, if you install them to user local, which I would recommend because everything works better there. Uh, and you have a look in user local seller, that's basically where the kind of root of where we install all of our uh, packages in there. So we have a look at the wget directory. We'll see the kind of basic structure is like, we have a directory called wget, we have a subdirectory with the version, in this case it's an old version, 1.13.4, and then we have the list of files in there. And you have in there like a bin directory, a shared directory, etc. And then these are then symlinked back into user local, which is so they're in a nice, easy place in your path, so you're not having to add a new path entry, for example, or library lookup entry for like every single thing you install in your machine. Um, so this was kind of a neat thing, particularly in the early days of homebrew. It meant, in theory at least, you could have a bunch of different versions of things like sitting side by side and stuff like that. But in reality, I'm not convinced it was necessarily worth the effort. We're probably not going to change now because things are so reliant on the way we build things. Um, but given that we didn't support like installing older versions of software very well, and we don't support kind of switching between versions of software very well, Compared to, for example, you know, if you install stuff with AppGet on Debian, then you can maybe just pick between three or four different versions of Boost. All those libraries and everything are configured such that they can be installed side by side nicely, and that you can just pick at compile time like which version you want to use. Um, with Homebrew, because of this system, I think partly we have relied on that not really being possible, I and mean, we've relied on having like a single canonical version, which is the latest version, which we try and push everyone to have the So, again, if we were to do it again, I would probably ditch this prefix system and I would just install normally into user work. So, another thing we do uh, is we try and avoid patching when we can. So, uh, if you've submitted a, home, uh, a patch to Homebrew, like for one of our formulae, i.e. you are submitting a patch to an upstream project that you want us to build against it, you may see me posting a little message like this. So basically what, like, I, I kind of more or less took a, a little stand back in the day, a 
because I used to get very annoyed with when I used Linux distributions and I would install whatever KDE, which I used to kind of do out of one. Yeah, shut up. Uh, but like, I would get annoyed that I would install it and then I would use some piece of software which I was kind of intimately involved with and I would realize that, oh, it behaves slightly differently to what I expected. And that's because the distributions, understandably, in many cases, uh, apply a bunch of patches on top of things because things are broken or not done the way they wanted to or whatever. Uh, and I always was a little bit uncomfortable with this because my idea is if you're installing KDE, you want to install KDE. You don't want to install Ubuntu's for KDE or Debian's for KDE or whatever. And that's effectively what you're installing when you have all these patches. And obviously the, the kind of really nasty example is when you look at what happened with Debian and the OpenSSL situation a few years ago where there was a patch which was made, which was submitted to Upstream, but Upstream never really kind of responded. I don't want to place any blame. I'm sure I would have done the same thing if, if I was in almost any situation there. But you ended up with a long running patch, which ended up like ruining crypto on a bunch of people's machines. And this stuff scares me a lot. And basically, as a result, I don't think package maintainers are in a good position to be making uh, patches to Upstream software, which are maintained for a long time. So. What we try in my day in Hobru now is if we're going to accept a patch, it's got to be at the very least submitted upstream. And we hope at least that upstream will show some movement on it. And then if upstream rejects the patch, then we will remove the patch from the software. Even unless it will like actively break the software. And then if upstream, for example, is unwilling to submit, unwilling to accept patches to fix compilation on OS X, well, that's when we say, okay, maybe it's time to just remove this package. Because it's you know the amount of time and effort it takes to try and effectively port and maintain forks of all this software that isn't ported to OSX to keep it running on OSX is not really worth the effort if the upstream maintainers don't want to do so. Um, so another thing we did relatively early on, there's been a lot of like shouting and gnashing of teeth uh, lately about code of conduct and whether they're a good thing or a bad thing, or whatever. We managed to kind of jump in there before there was any sort of like fallout on either side about this stuff. I just adopted the Python code of conduct or like a similar version of what they do. Um, there was, it's kind of interesting, we were, I guess, one of the first, we were the first projects, I guess, like us to kind of adopt stuff like that. Um, and it's actually been a super pleasant thing, I think, for everyone involved. I think it's a big player. It's good because it keeps your community able to kind of call you out and stuff if you're not behaving appropriately. And it also means that the community can often just be pointed to the code of conduct. And 99% of the time, I find when you point it to the code of conduct and just say, hey, that's not cool, then people will apologize, read it, move on, and have much more pleasant interactions in the future. So yeah, if you're running an open source project, I would highly recommend considering having one. And the final thing that we do, which is, I guess, a bit of apologizing, <coughs> but something which we are different from other projects on maybe is we accept like super new and super niche projects. So people can and often do sometimes make a project in like a couple of hours um, and then immediately submit it to Homebrew. And in, in cases like that, we want to wait and see that the project actually works and that you know someone is interested in using this beyond the person who's just written it. But in some cases, you know, there are stuff that you know blew up on hacker news or whatever. And a bunch of people are interested in sewing it, but it's only maybe a week old or whatever. So in that case, we can add it to Homebrew pretty quickly, and you can have stuff which is in Homebrew and usable by people within kind of a week or so. So from that perspective, I think it's been kind of an interesting experiment kind of adding these things because they tend not to break really these kind of simple little tools that are built in a short period of time. And it's kind of nice for us because we are able to expand and maybe attract different contributors who might not have been attracted to Homebrew otherwise. So again, with that, if I could do that again, uh, I would probably be less strict on accepting kind of these projects in the early days and just basically be more willing to remove stuff that's broken instead. So I think that's a, a kind of brief whistle stop tour of like some of the stuff we've done in Homebrew and like why. So I'd be interested if anyone has any questions to kind of answer them. Multiple versions of the same package. So for my production service, I need to lock uh, versions and then explicitly say this version of the software should be installed every time. 
Yeah. So formal at least suggests the way to the function. Yeah, so by default we do that, but then what we recommend is if you need to lock things down, then you can create your own tab, which is like a third party repository essentially, and just maintain effectively your own lockdown versus your own While I've got a platform somewhat unrelated to Homebrew, a, a minor rant that I hope you're pinning based on major minor versions and not patch versions, because my concern is I see a lot of places uh, who pin things based on patch versions and then don't keep up with security updates. So that's yeah. my little soapbox thing. Upgrade your patch and keep up with the security updates. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah, with the pending last week and the gift of being down, uh, what's your uh, 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 movement on the reliability, relying on the GitHub? Uh, so, as a GitHub employee, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my opinions are mixed. <laughs> but so, I, I, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think obviously for homebrew, um, speaking not as a GitHub employee, we might maintain a malum. And um, yeah, we, we have a, a single point of failure, which is not great. I mean, people can still install software and things like that without that, and our binary packages are not posted on GitHub. So that means if GitHub goes down, like, that doesn't happen. Basically, it affects our update mechanism and ability to file issues and pull requests um, rather than your ability to install software. So yeah, in some ways, that's regrettable, but then again, like, what GitHub gives us, like, I'm glad we don't have to maintain that. Like, I want to try and like move more and more stuff, like our CI, for example, like that I don't want to maintain. I would rather other companies do that and have like a kind of 99% uptime than me doing it and maybe having a slightly higher uptime but having a higher stress level as well. So, well, that's great. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's, uh, thank you. Well, one last thing, if anyone has any thoughts on features in Homebrew you really love or hate and would like to see change, find me at some time to call them and tell me. Thank you.